Thanks, hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, I'm very excited to talk about my job, which is a pretty fun job. Um, I work at Origin as an exercise physiologist and I've been here for about three years. Um, today I'm just going to talk about my journey of sort of um, entering the service that already existed and what I've done with it since and where I think we could be heading in the future. I'm going to focus strongly on the implementation um, as said in the introduction and also just explaining a little bit about um, my day-to-day -day job. So first of all, what is an exercise physiologist? A lot of people haven't heard of this condition and it's relatively new within the allied health field. Um, so it is a tertiary qualified allied health professional. So you do a bachelor's of exercise science and then a master's of exercise physiology. And we tend to specialize in the delivery of exercise prescription to people with chronic health conditions. Um, at university, I didn't study mental health, but it's been added as a chronic health condition. So it's definitely an emerging field for us as um, people to deliver um, treatment for people with mental health conditions. And um, in terms of our uh, knowledge of behaviour change and motivational interview, and I think it's quite a lovely fit um, for us to be working in this client base. So I get asked very often, oh, are you the personal trainer? And um, it's been too many times for me to care anymore. But just so you do know, um, personal trainers usually get around about six weeks to 12 months of um, education. And my hex bill is a lot higher than that. Um, personal trainers are absolutely great, though. And we do link in with them in the community. There's no reason why they can't um, work with the population that we're talking about as well. And it's really just about creating a wellness plan. The reason why EPs are kind of in this setting and why we'd advocate for us to be um, employed over personal trainers is we just do have that extensive knowledge of different chronic health conditions which are um, evident in this population group. And we do use exercise prescription and behaviour change techniques as part of our treatment. Um, if you're looking at physiotherapy, it's pretty similar to EPs. They do use like a hands-on approach and they tend to specialise in the diagnosis of musculoskeletal conditions, but they do expand into motivational interviewing and behaviour change principles as well. Um, so there's definitely a lot of overlap with us working together. So the physical health snapshot, this is not new news, I'm sure, to a lot of people in the room. So I'll just sort of um, relay the demographic of the people that we're working with. Um, so we do know that the physical health outcomes are a lot worse for people with a severe mental illness. Smoking rates are a lot higher, poor nutrition, sedentary behaviour, obesity, higher rates of cardiometabolic disease and a 10 to 25 um, year gap in their life expectancy. So what lifestyle interventions aim to do is help um, reduce these risk factors. So we aim to provide support and direction to physical health screening practices. We aim to not just screen, but intervene. Thanks, Andrew Watkins, for that nice little line. Um, to help with symptom management of lots of different symptoms that people have with mental health conditions. And to increase fitness. This is definitely something I'm going to expand on later. Um, we need to shift the focus away from weight and towards fitness. The fitter you are, the longer you will live. It's evidence-based and it's definitely something that we can be talking a lot more about. The prevention of chronic illnesses as well is a big area that we need to look at. All of these things um, up on the screen are preventable and there's um, no reason why we don't have a duty of care to provide that um, treatment to people entering mental health services. So how did we get here? In 2014, um, the psychosocial team, heavily led by Gina Woodhead, who's an excellent chief OT, met with ACU and they said, hey, we've noticed that um, our clients have really poor physical health outcomes and in particular can be associated with the antipsychotic um, weight gain that we're seeing and we want to do something about it. We're the groups team, we like to do different social groups and we want to add a physical element aspect. So out of that conversation, there came an agreement where ACU said, all right, what if we give you an EP for six months? We'll pay for them. Um, we'll put them in your service and they'll take students and they'll start to create a bit of a program. So they did a six um, month pilot and they had students on six week placements. They had 15 people referred per month over this time. In the first month, 37% attended their appointments, and then in the second month, 60% of people attended their appointments. 
So even in that short time frame, there was a bit of momentum growing within offering some physical health options for people in a mental health setting. Um, the average attendance of each person that saw an EP was three sessions over this six month period. Um, after this pilot program, they said, all right, seems like a pretty good idea. Let's get an EP of our own. So in 2015, Origin made a commitment to hire an EP, um, which is a pretty big deal because we know that comes with a bit of money. So they have put an investment in, we're going to address the physical health of our clients. So they appointed an EP. In 2016, a dietitian uh, joined the team and that's when I came on board as well. In 2017, we saw an increase in EFT, so the amount of um, time that we were working. And in 2019, um, it's pretty exciting, we're talking about implementing a physical health stream within the service. Um, my day-to-day -day work at the moment through the growth over those three years includes community partnerships, groups, one-to-one -one programming, um, where I've received grants to build and upgrade gym facilities, and the beginning of automated referrals, particularly looking at the Clozapine Clinic. We've also got a successful student program with ACU, and we tend to see students for around about six weeks um, throughout the year. And when I say we, I'm the only EP that works here. <laughs> so that's the stuff that I do. <laughs> so what's the origin snapshot? So here's just a bit of data on the average client that might walk into my doors. So in terms of someone's BMI, so their um, body weight associated with their height, the average person that I meet do, does fit into the obese category. In terms of using the SIMPAC tool, so we've spoken about a few tools today around measuring physical activity. I use the SIMPAC, which is the short form. Um, it's just one page and it kind of captures movement and sedentary activity and I just, um, we did a bit of a pilot study and I found it quite useful because there's a lot of sedentary time in this population. So what we found out is most people that I meet report that they spend around about 10 hours um, in bed, so that's them sleeping at night or just being in bed. Um, nine hours sedentary during the day, so not moving. It might be um, sitting in a car, sitting in a lecture, watching television, eating, so a lot of our day is sedentary. Uh, sitting in a lecture. <laughs> um, one hour napping a day, which is pretty common with a lot of the uh, medication and side effects that people experience. Um, people reported, I was surprised by this, an average of 30 minutes walking a day and one exercise session a week. So surprising data in some ways. So we know that the average client that I see is pretty sedentary, but might be doing some movement, which is great. In terms of the kind of referrals that I see, those anagrams, they just stand for different teams within the origin sector. So the main takeaways, 50% um, of the clients I see have are from the EPIC team, which is people experiencing some form of psychosis. So um, they're a high percentage of the referrals that I see coming second to the um, PACE team, the, the mood team and the hype team. So let's look at some of the physical health initiatives that have sort of helped guide the way that we've set up the service here. So one form that I keep coming back to is the HEAL Declaration. Um, this was written by the people up in Sydney, Simon Rosenbaum, Oscar Letterman, and a bunch of other EPs and other professionals, and they said, all right, people are entering a mental health service and they're leaving not as good as we found them in terms of their physical health. And that's where we're seeing these really scary life expectancy gap changes. So they've created a declaration to say, hey, we actually want to make measurable targets in fixing this. And I think it's time that Origin and other mental health services adopt this as a declaration, set targets to measure it, and actually try to achieve it. And I think we have a duty of care to do that for the clients entering our service. The other statements that I'm being guided by is the ESSA consensus statement. This is definitely worth a read if you're working in a mental health setting and you're thinking, okay, we need some form of movement, we need some form of physical activity in our service, but where do we start? This document just outlines the role of exercise physiologists and the impact that they can have in the service. But as a starting point, there's no reason why um, the existing staff can't adopt some of these strategies to begin with. 
And lastly, I really liked the Living Well report um, from New South Wales, and it just talks about um, the evidence-based programs that already exist. And the main outcomes that I kind of got from that um, is you want about 12 weeks of intervention, you do need health coaching, and this is quite important. So we know that even with healthy populations, you can't just tell someone to go and exercise and they'll go and do it and get a six pack, like it's a bit harder than that. And it's even harder for our population that have even more barriers than the healthy population. So the health coaching and support aspect of things seems to be quite an important key. Um, I've kind of added into my service asking people what kind of follow-up and support they would like. We offer SMS, we give them a call, um, and we might say, hey, you know, if you're struggling, do you want a bit of encouragement? Do you want to be left alone? And just setting up those support practices, envisioning, let's forecast when things are going great, this is the plan we've got. What about when things aren't going great? What should we do in those moments and how can we expect that and still give you support in that time? And the other ta big takeaway was diet and exercise programs in combination tend to have the best outcomes. So what are the main benefits of these lifestyle interventions? So in terms of mental health benefits, we've got um, symptom management. So that's a really big one. And um, that would almost be reason alone to, to refer someone to the service. There's sort of mixed evidence on this, but um, I t tend to tell people, look, everyone has slightly different responses to exercise. Let's see what yours is. Some people find their mood changes from one bout of exercise. Some people don't. Um, some people find it's helpful for their symptoms. If you have um, things like schizophrenia, it can be really helpful for positive symptoms. And we know that there's um, effects in depression and anxiety as well. In terms of the physical health outcomes, we're looking at um, reducing the risk of cardiometabolic disease, um, reducing waist circumference, looking at body mass, and reducing high blood pressure. Now, exercise as a standalone probably isn't going to impact um, all of those physical health outcomes. The biggest change that you'll probably see that we should continue to focus on is an increase in fitness, and we usually measure this through like aerobic fitness um, kind of training. The most simple way to do that would probably be a six minute walk test. Um, look, I tried it on my first day, it's pretty boring. And when you're trying to engage 15 to 24 year olds, they don't want to walk up and down a hallway for six minutes. So I had to come up with a few other funner tests. So what does my day to day look like? Here's just a few outcomes of kind of stuff that I'd fill my week with. Number one would be metabolic monitoring. Unfortunately, the completion rates of this is awful <laughs> um, and quite terrifying. Um, so this is definitely an area that we need to just put our hand up and say, we're pretty bad at this and let's figure out a way to improve. Um, so I call it catching. If I meet a new client, have a look, has their metabolic monitoring been done in in maybe three months, no, nope. six months, no, nope. 12 months, okay, we've caught it, let's do it. So basically that old risk strategy, if you see something, say something. It's like a bit of water on the floor. If it hasn't been done, just do it. So I'll do uh, metabolic monitoring for clients and then from there try to work with the treating team about what referrals need to happen. Do we recommend this patient get some bloods done? Do they maybe need to check in with their GP? Do we need to look at what medication they're on? Next to that, health coaching techniques. That's our lovely Jane Lynch up there. <laughs> um, so health coaching techniques, I like to use motivational interviewing. Um, these might include um, like fishing for change talk and really talking to people around um, listening to what they're saying, listening to what their goals are. We know that consumers want to talk about their physical health and providing them with a really safe space to do that and um, thinking about, okay, well, what would the next steps be for you if you were to start making some changes? Um, offering phone calls, SMS support, and to follow up on young people's goals. The next thing I might, day, might do in my day is go on a gym visit. We've got a few community partnerships, so I might go to a gym with a young person near their home and set them up with a program. And we might do it together, and then hopefully in the long term they can continue to do that um, without the presence of me there. 
Um, we have community links such as boxing, netball or basketball programs. These are heavily supported by RecLink. And then we also have origin-led groups where a client might see their case manager and then they might stay for their fitness group afterwards. And we offer these at our Parkfield sites, at our Sunshine sites and also in our inpatient facility. Lastly, home exercise programming um, is something that we offer. People might not feel like they want to come in for a group. Someone might see people individually, do a bit of an assessment and give them a bit of a plan of what to take away and then I'll try to see them within the week. Opportunities for the future include aiming to do more staff training so that staff can also pick up on maybe if some, someone's really sedentary to just have recommendations of, hey, have you thought about moving more? Have you thought about physical activity? Did you know it can help some people with symptom management and starting that change talk so that we're all kind of saying the same thing? I think sometimes when you get specialist services in, what can happen is we handball um, all of the discussion around physical health to those individuals. A good example might be, oh, I don't really feel qualified to talk to someone about their diet. But if they're drinking soft drink all day, anyone could say, have you thought about reducing your soft drink intake? That might be a good idea. So I think um, giving ourselves permission to have those conversations and it can be kind of nice to also be vulnerable with your young people and say, yeah, I really struggle with that as well or I, I find it hard to get motivated. What sort of physical activity do you like to do? Um, and it can be nice just to break down those power differentials that we see in mental health settings and reduce the stigma there and just talk as two humans who are both trying to maybe um, think about their health and to be a healthier person. There's been a bit of good evidence with um, looking at staff initiatives, so that's something that I'd like to introduce in the future as well. Um, it can also increase awareness of what is an EP in the service, um, and staff get to have the experience of being the client, working on their mental health, and we know unfortunately that staff in mental health settings also have um, slightly worse physical health than comparative to other services. So may as well <laughs> work on us as well. <laughs> So some of the community partnerships I've set up, um, I'm pretty stoked about. We've got some really good um, connections in the community. The first one is Yoga Hood. Um, these are a trauma-informed yoga care service. Um, they offer six-week blocks to um, people and they come in and provide you with a yoga instructor. Um, We've done quite a few blocks with them. After the completion of the course, the young people get a yoga mat from Lululemon, which is pretty great. Um, so they're an excellent partnership that we've built up. And there's no reason why others couldn't reach out to them um, and also ask for those services to come in completely free as well. Boxing. Recently, we've brought out our first boxing class um, with the help of lovely clinician and very talented Craig McNeil at the Origin Parkfield site. Um, it's had excellent attendance rates. We do our classes in blocks now. We used to just sort of roll them through and people's attendance kind of wasn't as good. Um, so we've tried some six week pilots, but looking at the evidence, we'll probably move to 12 week blocks once we know what kind of exercise we'd like to continue to deliver. Um, next is RecLink Australia. Um, so these, this company provides Origin with lots of different referral pathways. Um, they're most known for their RecLink Cup that they do once a year in the AFL. Um, space, but they offer our clients with pretty much free gym access to lots of different gyms. So often I might go to North Melbourne Rec Centre or Melbourne City Baths and have a young person come with me, pay our $2 and then we just do a workout together. I tend to make an effort to not wear my lanyard, to not um, look like I'm a clinician in that moment. We're just two people going to the gym, doing a workout and then I get to do a workout too, which is always fun. And um, it kind of normalises the activity a little bit more. So as a case manager, there's no reason why you can't go for a bit of a walk with your client or just start to normalise and role model that physical activity as well. So some big wins in the EP program. So we've recently obtained a grant to upgrade our inpatient facility. Um, so we've got a new, um, new gym there as of last week, which is really exciting. And part of this upgrade includes, um, we've ordered a bunch of Fitbits. So I think what we'll be doing is rolling out some staff programming and having some step challenges and building a bit of excitement around the staff. And then hopefully um, the literature tells us that that'll increase referral rates for young people to also have those experiences of um, wearing fitness devices and being a bit more motivated about their own movement. 
So next I'm going to talk about some challenges that I've sort of faced as an EP in a mental health service. Um, some of the difficult things is often you can feel a little bit isolated if you're someone working kind of uh, by yourself without any other professions of the similar qualification to you. Um, having low staff has been really challenging. Um, we've just recently changed the structure of our group program team, which has definitely impacted the way that we run our groups. Um, and we've had to be a bit more resourceful and build up those communal linkages or literally go around to case managers and ask them what their special skill is and then make them do a group with me. <laughs> so we've found a yoga instructor and a boxing instructor so far, so hopefully I'll find someone who can like juggle or do acrobatics or something next. <laughs> Um, any psychotic weight gain is always going to be an ongoing um, challenge for anyone working in the physical health team in a mental health setting. Um, and the timing of referrals is probably the biggest challenge that I experience. Um, so I'm quite passionate about automated referrals and just making this standard care. Because um, at the moment, unfortunately, because I'm an optional service, people don't want to meet me because I sound really scary on paper. It's like, hi, do you want to meet the exercise lady who's probably really mean and she'll make you run? <laughs> but then they meet me in person and hopefully I'm a bit nice and I'm not going to make people run if they don't want to. Um, so I think by making this an optional service, we're actually um, not providing people with that duty of care. You don't get asked when you join Clozapine Clinic if you want to have your blood taken. It's actually really important um, to, to measure how your body's going when we're putting you on these um, risky medications. So why isn't it that we say, hey, for your Clozapine appointment, you're seeing the nurse, you're seeing the doctor, and then you're booked in with the EP. So this is something that I feel really strongly about, and we've sort of spoken about introducing this in the framework of a wellness clinic that other services have done, and it's worked successfully, so why reinvent the wheel? Um, it's something that we're hopefully going to start rolling out more formally this year. Um, some other challenges have been a motivation. It's probably the biggest thing that patients report to me as the reason why they're not um, able to exercise, and it's impacting um, where they're at. We use motivational strategies, um, motivational interviewing stages of behaviour change, and there's different ways you can construct the way that you talk to these young people. And this is something that case managers do on a regular basis. We just need to use that framework and put, men, uh, put physical health on the forefront of our mind when we're talking about that. Sometimes we accept a barrier, oh, I'm not motivated, I don't want to do it, and we say, oh, okay. But really digging deeper and kind of just understanding, okay, well, what sort of things would motivate you? Or understanding, have you done anything in the past? Um, so having some tr strategies for how to talk about motivation can be really helpful and applying it in a really non-judgmental way I think is quite an important skill. I think often we feel like we don't want to be sort of preaching to clients or we feel maybe uncomfortable about our own physical activity so we think, oh, who am I to tell someone to go for a walk? Um, but it's really about just the service that we're providing and we're trying to provide educated information about physical activity and the health outcomes. Lastly, space and resources can be really hard. Um, most EPs that work in a mental health setting, similar to me, will um, go to several different sites across their week. So setting up camp and then putting everything away each day can be a little bit challenging. And also flying in and out and seeing staff um, once a week or whatnot can be a little bit tricky as well. Um, so we're constantly looking for ways to sort of help improve this. Um, haven't really figured it out yet, but it's a challenge. <laughs> so some solutions. Um, community partnerships, as I mentioned earlier, to help facilitate low staff and to build community linkages. So we can look at someone's wellness plan and look at their recovery and say, actually, you're kind of fitted here and it looks like you're already ready to link in with your gym. You don't need to do one-on-one -on -one with me. Um, so really understanding where those community linkages fall in play so that our discharge options are a lot better for people. Automated referral pathways. So I spoke a little bit about this being standardised care and us changing the language around wanting to meet someone potentially scary and really mean or you're booked in to see the reg and you're booked in to see Lauren. Um, understanding readiness for change is really important and something I'm going to do um, to help um, with this is start to prioritise my referrals based on um, readiness for change but also the needs of the individual. So there'll be certain clients, I get this all the time, like so and so hurt their knee, they want to see you and I'm like oh okay. 
fine. I'd love to do a knee assessment. I haven't done one in a little while, um, but they're probably slightly less important to me than someone who's maybe just gained like 12 kilos. So um, being able to prioritise and filter the needs of your service is really important. Um, the Keeping Body in Mind project up in Sydney did this really well, where they pretty much said, we're not seeing anyone except people with first episode psychosis and we're going to get it right. And then after we've done that project and it works, we're going to expand it to the next highest needs clients, those on clozapine. And then we're going to see if that works. Um, so there's a few different options in terms of prioritising the service that we'll probably look at this year to try to get better outcomes, rather than just trying to see everybody. So I've touched on this a little bit earlier, but a really big message that I want to share with people today is exercise does not cause weight loss. Um, sometimes we're setting people up for failure, and I think it's really important the language and education we use around this topic. So we need to move beyond weight loss. Most clients will come to me and say, I want to lose weight, or I've gained all this weight from the medication, I just want to be thin again, I just want to, I'll be happy when I lose all the weight. And it takes a lot of work to sort of start to break down those fixed beliefs on what your life might be like if the scales read a different number. Um, what I try to do is focus on fitness, because I know that that'll help with life expectancy and symptom management. So they might get in the door based on wanting to lose weight, but if we say to them, great, let's try to lose weight, and then four weeks later they haven't seen any results, they're not going to come back, and they're going to have really negative experience, and they're potentially going to attribute that to exercise, and then be someone who says, oh, I've tried exercise, it doesn't work for me. Um, so really shifting the focus away from weight and shifting it towards how you feel, what your strengths are, what do you want to be good at, what, what does your perfect week look like if you're an active person. There's a kind of much better strategies to focus on someone's wellness as opposed to what the number on the scales is. Um, and a little bit of data, I went to the Equally Well Symposium yesterday and in general populations there is a 1 in 10 chance someone who is obese will enter the normal weight range. So we don't want to set people up for failure and encourage them to lose weight and to try to support them in that. Um, we can acknowledge that that's a really important goal, but we might say to them, hey, these outcomes are probably a bit more likely, are you happy to focus on them for now? And maybe weight is just not our top priority or not as important. So that's why we tend to take fitness measures and other measures to say, hey, well, we've just measured five things, so let's see which ones we can change. And maybe you could do more push-ups and maybe you could do more squats in the coming weeks as opposed to the scales. So I'll just finish quickly with some of the guidelines for physical activity. I think we've already spoken a little bit about this today. Um, so there's different ways to meet the guidelines. You can do your 150 minutes of moderate exercise or 300 minutes a week. Um, resistance training, strength training is recommended two days a week. But something that I found really interesting is there's actually sedentary guidelines now. And I feel like this is a little bit more applicable to a lot of people who are entering a mental health service. It's a bit overwhelming, I think, for anyone to look at these guidelines up on a screen. Like, I find it overwhelming, and I am very active. Um, the way that they report it, like 150 minutes, I was like, that sounds like a lot of minutes. <coughs> like, I wonder how long a movie is. Like, do you have to be walking during a whole movie? Anyway. <laughs> I like to sit and watch my movies. So the way I sort of look at it is it's more about movement and it's more about increasing your movement. We know from the evidence that 10 minute blocks tend to be helpful, but for someone sedentary, making a plan for them when they're having a really low day, it might be getting out of bed, it might be going to the toilet, it might be setting an alarm and using the toilet that's upstairs instead of the one that's downstairs. So there's a lot of these strategies that people can just move a little bit more at home. And if you're setting those goals and they actually achieve it, then you're starting that strength-based approach of, oh, I did the thing, cool, maybe I could do it again. And I think um, sometimes we focus a little bit too much on the end goal of like, when I'm running marathons, this is what my life will look like. But you really have to sort of start at square one with this population and make it a bit more um, bite-sized. Bite so that sort of flows into the message of move more, sit less. Um, I know some people have, you know, the Fitbits and whatnot, and they'll vibrate if you don't sort of move enough or we have standing desks and things like that. So we want to sort of provide our clients with those opportunities to be a little bit more active in their day as well. Um, as I said, it might be just going... I have one client at the moment who just walks around his house. Um, he, he's too paranoid to go outside, so that's fine. He's got his phone, he's got his step counter, and he just tries to clock up. We started with 3,000 steps, and now we're up to 7,000 steps a day, which is actually really good. 
So just the setting those little goals can be helpful. Some people like watching the little YouTube workouts, some people like the apps on the phone. Um, just about finding the right strategy for that person that works. So lastly, I'll just talk about like what to do with people that aren't really ready um, or they don't maybe meet the criteria or maybe they didn't get prioritised in my new fancy referral system that I'm running tomorrow. Um, there's a few things that we can do to help sort of these people with their recovery journey. So providing as much information as possible and feeling comfortable to actually talk about exercise and physical activity I think is probably the first barrier to break down. Um, thinking about motivation and interviewing, forecasting with clients, what would it look like if you were to make a change? What sort of things would you like to do um, within your week? Are there any sports that you used to play? Things like that. Um, identifying their barriers, so what parts make it hard, what foreseeable things would make it challenging for us. Setting realistic goals. And really acknowledging that something's better than nothing, it's just moving a little bit more might be the first step in their wellness program. Walking appointments are encouraged or starting a walking group. These are all things you don't need any resources for that anybody could do. Um, here's just some helpful kind of conversation starters. And if you take away one thing from today, it's how to talk about exercise. I kind of think about how smoking cessation has really been such a hot topic over the last five years and how we've really um, embedded in mental health services a better approach to talking about smoking and to help um, offer people nicotine replacement therapy. And I think we could probably just apply the same model for exercise. We just need some tips of like how to talk about it. Um, so just by simply asking someone, hey, are you someone who's exercising? Do you have any physical activity in your week? Would you like to change that? It's exactly the same philosophy that I, I apply when I ask someone, are you a smoker? Would you like to change that? It's a really non-judgmental way to just ask somebody where they're at and you get a bit of a picture of kind of if they're in a stage ready for change or if they're not in a stage ready for change. So that's all I really wanted to cover today. Um, thanks a lot for listening. Well, thank you, Lauren, for that, um, for that talk. Um, so I'll start off by introducing myself. My name is Junior. I'm 25 years, oh, I was going to say years old, but years young. Um, I was born and raised in New Zealand. I moved to Australia in uh, 2009, so I've been here for 10 years now. I graduated school here. I uh, did three years of my, uh, my school uh, senior year at uh, Hoppers Crossing Secondary College. So, um, yeah, so now, 25 years old. Um, oh, yeah, just grateful to be here, to be a part of um, this uh, mental health. Uh, you know, this is um, something that we need to address because it happens to most of our kids and even like adults as well. Um, so yeah, um, I'll start off by telling a story about a guy I knew very well. Um, now he was he was like any any kid in high school. I think um, you know we always um, you know the way society is, it kind of tries, you know, like makes us um, fit into society. And um, the kind of things it does to us is, um, you know, we try and fit in, into something that sometimes it becomes too major to a point where we kind of lose ourselves, like who we really are. Um, and so this kid would do his best to try and please others, um, you know, through, um, you know, to, to find true happiness. Uh, so I think on that journey, um, you know, he started doing things that he's seen on TV or seen others do, or maybe his older cousins or his older siblings. Um, and uh, yeah, through that journey, he kind of suffered from depression and anxiety and things like that. Um, and then, you know, as, as that uh, pulled through, uh, through high school and things like that, um, you know, he started asking questions like why, like, you know, he's got a mom, he's got a dad. You know, other people don't have families. Um, you know, other people, there's people out there who's, who's born without mom and dads, uh, but yet he's still feeling alone. Um, so, yeah, so eventually led him to being in, in go, uh, going into a mental hospital and yet still asking questions. So his time in mental hospital, it got to the point where it, didn't, it doesn't matter what anyone said, like, you know, to try and encourage him on how to, how to get through what he was going through. Um, he just didn't trust anybody. He didn't trust anyone because he's tried so hard to try, you know, to look for that joy that we all, we all seek. Um, and 
Yeah, so during that um, process, um, you know, he was, he was lost uh, um, yeah, um, in the mental hospital. Um, and, but coming off uh, what Lauren was speaking about, um, there was programs in the mental institute, um, you know, things like psychologists to speak with, um, exercise with Lauren, um, you know, really helped. Um, you know, there was options there. Uh, that, that guy, he was 23 at the time, um, he was released uh, from, mental, from the mental hospital um, back to his family. Um, he pretended his way out of the mental hospital. They said, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, I'm all right, I'm all right. So he went home, but he wasn't all right. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't all right. He was still, you know, paranoid and things like that, walking around the house and things like that. And, um, you know, there was options there for him, like things like exercise, um, you know, psychologists to speak to. Um, yeah, and just like support, um, you know, just to, uh, what's, what's the word? Um, I, would, I would say comfort. Um, yeah, so I think um, through that, um, yeah, it was it was it was also challenging because he couldn't leave the house. Um, you know, he was he was too paranoid of what was going on around him because he didn't trust no one. Um, so I think it was through faith, it was through faith and believing that everything was going to be okay that um, he stepped forward. I think uh, with hope. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just. I planned something, like I wrote something down just to try and think of what to say. I don't have any slides or anything, but yeah, I planned on what to say and I actually bought a couple of books in my bag and I left that plan at home, out of all, yeah, out of all the books. I left like the main plan at home. I was like, all right, okay, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, anyways, where was that? Um, yeah, so, yeah, um, so with faith, I've, I've, faith is like a, to me, it's like, it's like an extended circle on where you can walk forward. Now, with faith, if, if, if you've got no faith, like hopelessness and things like that, no faith at all, you can't move anywhere because there's no faith at all. It, the, the, the more extended your faith is, the more like, kind of space you have to, to kind of just progress. Does that make sense? Um, so it was through that faith that, um, that he actually stepped up and actually um, started believing in himself. And um, again, through that faith, it was through progress, and then, oh, oh, hi, Monica. So Monica's my psychologist, is there? <laughs> Although through my faith, I was like, I walked forward, and then I see Monica standing there, she's like, oh. <laughs> and, you know, and then she helped, you know, with her, with her strengths in life, she helped me, um, you know, kind of progress. So the more, like, you know, I humbled myself and, and kind of just let that help come through me and, like, you know, just accept the help. So I was like, okay. Not too bad at all. But then there's all that paranoia and things like that. But through her help, my faith got bigger and bigger. So the circle extended. And then I continued to walk forward. And then, oh, Lauren! It's like, oh, what's up? <laughs> oh, what's up? Oh, what's up? <laughs> so, yeah, and then we start doing our thing, you know, like Lauren, you know, well, I don't, like the exercises that she was doing was. um was what I really wanted to do because I really enjoyed boxing at, at a young age. Um, you know, I always, always had a passion of boxing, like watching Muhammad Ali and all the old school fights. Our boxing matches, not fights, because uh, you pay to watch. So, but um, yeah, no, I, you know, it was, it was awesome because I think there was a share story that me and Lauren had at the park um, was um, <clears throat> we were doing pad work, I'd say, at the park. Uh, it was across the road, the, the Sunshine Youth Origin, it was across the I was going to say across the ditch, it was across the, what do you call it, train station? Anyways, yeah, so we were doing our sparring sessions and, you know, she'll do her one, one, two, one, two, three, and then, you know, with the pads. And then this random guy just comes along, she's like, oh, what did he say? He, he said something like, um, yeah, she was, he was like, oh, you a professional fighter or something like that. And, and my ego just went, Pfft. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was like, yeah, like, it was like, it's like, like a butterfly sting, like, yeah. But anyways, yeah, and like. Me and Laura looked at each other and was like, should we, should we just lie to this guy? And, yeah. But he was a big guy, like you can see, but he, he probably had the passion for, for boxing as well. But um, yeah, so just things like that, it was really like, it was awesome, me. So like, yeah, just being able to um, also, you know, um, do exercise with other patients that also suffer from mental health um, and just seeing their journey and like, you know, really helped to know that I wasn't alone. Oh, I'll give it away. Oh, this guy was me. Oh, man, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. I'm a bad liar, so forgive me. Yeah. But yeah, so, yeah. So, oh, give it a wee now. Yeah. No, yeah, but that guy was me. So, you yeah, know, it was, it, was really, it was really nice to, to know that I wasn't the only one going through this. And I think, um, you know, through my experience in life, my 25 years of life, um, I, th I think we all kind of um, experience like a, um, you know, depression and things like that now and then. Um, again, there was a, there was a saying that um, this lady once told me, I forgot her name, but I, I think we all know that saying, like, it's like a, there's a battle in our mind going on and it's the one that we feed, uh, wins the battle kind of thing. So, um, yeah, stepping out of faith and, yeah, so it was really good and, and then, where am I? So moving forward, sorry, I, I had to really, because when I, I got the message from Emily, thanks to Emily, she said, oh, would you be, and Lauren, if they asked me if I could speak, I really had to rewind time kind of thing and like try and figure out because I was too much like, yeah, like trying to live a purposeful life. <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, it was, um, yeah, so going back, so after that, you know, yeah, we're doing the exercise programs and things like that, it really helped, um, you know, um, you know, they have the, um, Lauren's got her strengths in her area, and it really helped me um, just to be more social, like sociable. Um, I started, so when I got home, like, you know, paranoid and things like that, um, I kind of started off with um, my socializing kind of started playing the PlayStation. So I'm um, playing online and things like that. No, so it's like, you've got your headphones and you're talking to someone, but you could, you're not there physically. So it, I started playing FIFA and games like that, but then I started to make friends online, um, you know, and like, yeah, and so they kind of built my confidence to like say, oh, so I can actually like get up there and like talk to people again. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's just to help with that, with um, Monica as well, um, it was awesome to have. Um, yeah, so as, as he progressed, I think he's, he started, oh, now I'm saying he again, I started. <laughs> Yeah, I started, um, you know, I've always wanted to um, help out with the community wherever I can. Um, so my family had a church they were going to. Um, so yeah, I started um, getting more involved with the church. Now, I wasn't really a church person because growing up, you know, I always went to church. I was like, oh, whatever, stop talking. Like, you know, stop trying to brainwash everyone. Like, yeah, like, no, on the real, on the real. That's what I thought at the time. But um, yeah, so I started getting involved in the church. Um, I knew that. You know, the gifts and passions that I have was music, so I, I used that to um, wherever I could, um, you know, for the greater good, I guess. So, yeah, started doing youth work. Oh, started doing, um, oh, yeah, and started doing youth work as well, uh, volunteer work for um, the CMY, I think it is, uh, the council. They mainly focus on, um, on the youth, the kids at youth, um, on things that they struggle with in high school. Um, like the same thing that, that me, like in high school, was suffering from. Um, yeah, so um, that year, I think it was a, the year after he was admitted out of hospital, out of the mental hospital, um, I started, um, what is it, yeah, being part of the worship team. Um, out of nowhere, I started writing out the music for, for our worship team. Like, you know, it will come to a point where I was like, I'll stand around and it's like, no one else knows how to write down music and like kind of teach every part to each person, like each instrument, like whoever's playing the instrument, because everyone kind of, need, and I knew I, I could help, but those insecurities were kind of holding me back, but then again, faith comes in, so I was like, okay, okay, we'll just, you know, just, just step into it wherever I could help, so, yeah, we had a few um, good youth services, and um, I think the paradigm to my story is, um, is uh, like, I, I, I found my purpose, if that makes sense, um, my purpose on, on what I'm here to do, um, yeah, so, you know, we, we did things that year, it was 2018, you know, um, our youth went out to camp, um, you know, we, like our youth, we had a fundraiser for, for that camp, it was called a multicultural night. Now, all these things that I learned in high school, like being in like Pacific Island dance groups and stuff, like I was able to teach to the kids at church, uh, which was awesome, and everyone, you know, the kids are all excited about it and stuff, like, oh, can you, I'll teach you the haka right now, I was like, that's, I <laughs> But yeah, it's like, um, yeah, so just things like that was, um, it was, it was good. And um, I never, I never take for granted and forget those who helped me along the way. I think we're all part of this, this journey together. But um, yeah, I won't, I won't drag my conversation too long, but um, now I'm, I'm looking after my parents now. I'm the youngest of four. Um, yeah, so 
because all my siblings, they all got kids and they all got kids and they got their own houses that they're trying to pay off. So I'm like, okay, I'll look after my parents because I'm the last one left yeah, to, to look after my parents. So yeah, so again, purposeful life. Um, we work with what we got and um, I'm grateful. I think gratitude as well comes with faith. Um, and I think most importantly, love uh, that helped me, like actually knowing what love is and like what it means to love. Um, yeah, so, and, and loving others. And I think um, by loving others is, um, is to love yourself at the same. And just, uh, yeah, just to know ourselves and know what we're good at. And like forgive, <laughs> forgiveness as well. That was something that I was struggling with, like, you know, in high school as well. Because like someone says something bad to me or like other just like kind of make me insecure and kill, kill my self-esteem or like just make me angry and rage. So like that balance was, was like, yeah, left wing, right wing, but just finding that balance. But um, yeah, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, now I'm yeah, looking after my parents, I'm paying dad's mortgage. Um, dad got sick, I think that same year I got out of hospital. So he retired, um, he had a heart failure. He, he, um, he went into hospital. But that opened a door for me to kind of live a purposeful life, <laughs> like to help out my, my parents. And so it, it happened in good time. Um, so yeah, help, helping out the mortgage, um, helping out mom and dad. Um, and uh, yeah, just still um, helping out the community as well. And always searching, I think every day, every day has its own challenge. So um, yeah, but um, I'm open to any questions. Like, I don't want to drag this too long, but I'm open to any questions and I'll answer them the best and yeah, I'll answer them as truthfully as I can. Yeah. So just feel free to ask any questions, that's cool.